Our penultimate speaker of the day, ladies and gentlemen, is a doctor who specializes in care of the dying and works at King's College London's Cicely Saunders Institute, where she uses national data sets to examine patterns in palliative care. She aims to explore what it means to have a good death along with the individual and societal barriers to achieving this. The big topic we're talking is how to have a good death. Please welcome Catherine Sleeman. When I tell people that I work with patients who are dying, they usually do one of two things. Some people, the brave ones, lean in and whisper to me that my job must be so depressing. But most people don't do that. Most people shuffle awkwardly and change the conversation. I have observed that people find it hard to talk about dying. So I've decided I'm going to jump straight in with the bad news. We are all going to die. In fact, the past decades of medical research and innovation and progress have completely failed to reduce global death rates, which remain, remain firmly fixed <laughs> at 100%. <laughs> OK, so that's the bad news. Of course, there's good news, too. If the past decades of medical progress haven't made death any less inevitable, then, of course, there have been enormous positive impacts on health. For example, the average human lifespan has almost doubled over the past 150 years because the things that used to kill us, infections, childbirth, and now very often preventable or treatable. But, and it's a big but, we have to die of something. And what's happened is we've swapped dying at relatively young ages from things that would have killed us pretty quickly for dying slower deaths in older age. Now, I'm less interested in when we will die. I'm most interested in how we will die. What will the rate and pattern of our final deterioration be like? Well, of course, it depends what we die from. So for around a fifth of us, we'll die suddenly, unexpectedly, from things like heart attacks and strokes and accidents. And we will live with very good physical function until that moment, that minute, that hour of death. Another fifth of us will die from cancer, and we'll live with similarly good physical function until quite close to the end of life, when there's usually a deterioration that occurs over a number of weeks. But the rest of us, the majority of us, will live with and die from chronic medical problems like heart failure, kidney failure, Parkinson's disease, dementia, and our final weeks, and months and years will be characterized by relapses and remissions on a background of a slowly progressive deterioration in function. Now, I know that a prolonged deterioration before we die is not exactly the sort of thing that everyone is looking forward to. But maybe there are some advantages. The ability to anticipate death and to prepare for it the potential to have choice and control over the manner of our deaths, the opportunity for a good death. A good death? What does this even mean? Well, it won't surprise you to hear that a good death, like a good birth, means different things to different people. Um, we find that most people who have a short amount of time left to live, they choose to prioritize the quality of their lives. So they want to be symptom-free, comfortable, in a place of their choosing, surrounded by their loved ones, and free from the paraphernalia of medical interventions, the tubes and the lines and the drips. They would rather have this than this. But there's a problem because even these relatively simple preferences are often not met. 
There's a complete mismatch, in fact, between people's preference for where they die, most people would choose to die in their own homes, and the reality of where people end up dying, which for the majority is in hospital. And this isn't just a problem for the individual, for the dying person themselves. It's a big problem for society because, and this is going to sound very blunt, but dying in hospital, it's expensive. Now, of course, no one would deny the dying the health care they need, whatever the price tag. But the problem is that the fortune spent on sophisticated hospital care for people who are dying may paradoxically be worsening and not improving their quality of life and quality of death. In fact, care of the dying is increasingly associated with more hospitalizations, more invasive tests and procedures. And those people who have the highest health care expenditure at the end of life, well, they often have the most suffering. So modern medicine, with all of its technological wizardry, may be doing more to complicate death than to improve it. What's the solution? Well, one aspect to the solution, I think, is what I do, palliative care. So for those who don't know, palliative care is a philosophy of care for people who are approaching the ends of their lives, where the goal of care is to improve the quality of that person's life, rather than trying to increase the quantity, the amount of time that they have left to live. Palliative care, quite simply, aims to find out what the worst problems are for the patient and their family and then tries to improve them. And although many of the patients we see are elderly and frail, there's no age restriction to palliative care. So I would like to tell you about a patient of mine called Angela. Angela is a young woman. She's in her early 30s. She's younger than me. And she has breast cancer, which recently spread to her brain. And as a consequence of that, she has headaches, and she has fits, and she's becoming increasingly sleepy, spending most of the time in bed now. She's just started to lose the sight in one of her eyes. She's dying. In addition, Angela is a single parent to three young children, and she's frightened. She's frightened about what's happening to her, and she's frightened about what's going to happen to them. And so palliative care for Angela has focused on improving her physical symptoms, so drugs to help her headaches and control her fitting, on counselling to help her and her children come to terms with what's happening, and on social work support to try and ensure that Angela is able to make firm plans for the care of her children when she's dead. Now, I know what you're all thinking. You're all thinking that my job is so depressing. But I'm not depressed, because Angela's death is inevitable. It's tragic, and it's too early. But no one can change that. My job is about accepting the inevitability of her death and making the present and the future better for her and better for her children. And I could tell you hundreds of quite emotive anecdotes about the ways in which palliative care can improve life for people who don't have much left of it. But I know that you know that anecdotal data is biased, and what you really want to know is, where's the strong, objective evidence for the benefit of this approach? OK. So a couple of years ago, a research team in the United States published a trial that generated headlines that went around the world. In the trial, they took a group of patients who had lung cancer. It was newly diagnosed, but it was advanced cancer, so the patients were expected to die from it. And the patients were randomized into two groups. One group got standard cancer care, which meant that they were seen and treated by a cancer specialist according to usual practice. The second group got exactly the same standard cancer care, but in addition, they received support from a palliative care team. So they had two teams looking after them, not one. 
the researchers found that the people receiving palliative care, they had improved symptom control. They were less often hospitalized. They had less aggressive care, and they were more likely to die in their own homes. Palliative care, as we've believed instinctively for decades, improved their quality of life and quality of death. But that, that wasn't what made the headlines. People worry that there has to be some kind of a trade-off between quality of life and quantity of life, that you can't have both. So palliative care, okay, it might help me live a bit better, But if I don't have those fancy tests and treatments, won't I also die a bit quicker? But the opposite happened. In the trial, they found that the patients who received the palliative care lived significantly longer than the patients who received standard cancer care alone. So they got both. They got improved quality of life and improved survival. No trade-off. Well, you would expect, wouldn't you, that people would be desperate for this, that anyone with advanced lung cancer would make sure that they were referred to a specialist palliative care team. Quality and quantity, who wouldn't want that? But the reality is our patients and even our healthcare providers are reluctant to embrace palliative care. Doctors say to me that their patients are not ready for palliative care, not yet. And I think not ready to feel a bit better. Not ready maybe even to live a bit longer. When, when will they be ready? What are they waiting for? And I think the answer is that they're waiting for us, for our societal views and expectations to change. Because over the past hundred years, there's been a progressive veiling of death in society. Previous generations were brought up to face the realities of death. Dying was viewed as natural. It was expected, accepted. But now, we hide death. We put it behind closed doors, and we whisper about it. Dying has become medicalized, sterilized, isolated, taken from the home and put in care homes and hospitals. And as a consequence, we've been given permission not to have to think about it. The successes of medicine the same successes that led to the dramatic increase in life expectancy mean that even amongst doctors, death can be regarded as failure, something to be avoided at all costs. Doctors even find it hard to use the words death and dying with patients. We say things like, Your disease is life-threatening. Time may be short now. You should prepare for the worst. When what we really mean is you're dying. You're dying. You're dying. Why do we find it so hard to say these words? Who are we protecting, the patient or ourselves? We tell ourselves that we're avoiding harm, but maybe we're simply avoiding the uncomfortable truth. Death and dying are necessarily at the center of my job, palliative medicine, but for the rest of medicine, and particularly in medical education, death is firmly at the periphery. When I graduated from medical school a few years ago, It didn't even occur to me that part of my job as a doctor would be to look after people who were dying. I'd been taught about saving lives. No one ever told me that saving deaths is important too. That saving deaths 
has value. The same issues run through medical research. Of the one point something billion pounds spent every year in this country on medical research, just 0.1% is allocated to palliative and end-of-life care research. Did I mention that we're all going to die? That's 10p in every 100 pounds. And I know, of course, there have been extraordinary, life-saving advances that come out of the remaining 99 pounds and 90p. And we have to celebrate them. But we also have to appreciate that dying isn't optional. And life-saving is not possible forever. As doctors, I think we need to understand when to let a person die with dignity and at peace, rather than feeling this default obligation to use every available test and treatment on them. I think we need to remember that sometimes conversation can be more powerful than technology. And we need to appreciate that the time will come for all of us when it's appropriate to refocus from cure to care. But the trouble is, people find it hard to talk about dying. We all do. We're frightened of death, frightened of being dead. And yet, the funny thing is, society needs death. We need death as much as we need new life. The end of life, I think, should be as important as its beginning. But in our ceaseless pursuit of life-saving, we appear to have forgotten that. So hands up, who wants to die? Of course we don't, but we will. Our research has shown us what patients who are dying want and how we can try and achieve that as healthcare professionals. But there's a missing piece to this puzzle, and that is how we, as a society, view death. We prepare for the arrival of a new baby. We plan for it. We think about what we're going to buy and what we're going to call the new baby. And it's part of our daily life, our conversation. Why do we not prepare for our deaths in the same way? I would like everyone to have a good death. But we can't achieve that unless we, as a society, stop whispering and start talking about it. Thank you.